This segment is brought to you in part by Swim Baits Plus. Are you looking for that hard to find swim bait? Are you looking for that impossible rare color? Are you looking for great prices? Visit them on Instagram at, at @swimbaitsplus. Hello everybody, welcome to our Trophy Hunters segment. My guest today is a trophy hunters of all kind, including big game. He's a big bass content creator on YouTube and Instagram, professional swim bait guide. Please welcome to the show Manny Chi. Manny, thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Honored to be here. It's a great honor for me to have you here as well. Uh, let's get right down to this. What got you chasing trophy-sized fish? Uh, I guess it was actually like one event. Uh, while I was out here in Arizona fishing one of my hometown lakes, Saguaro Lake, and it was uh, November, just a day after they had stocked trout. And uh, I went out and I got to see the actual uh, huge bass chasing down these trout. Uh, I had only heard of that before, and I had never seen it myself. I was just starting my guide service and kind of trying to find uh, my market, really. I wasn't sure if I was if I was going to be fly fishing for bass because that was something that I was doing a lot. Whether it was going to be fly fishing for bass, uh, I knew that I couldn't just do the regular like conventional fishing tournament style fishing for bass. A because I was never very good at that, and B because I already had a couple friends out here that had very good guide services that were catering to that market already. So there was no point in me trying to do that also. And by accident ran into these, you know, there's this pot of huge fish working these trout. And when I saw that, it, you know, it was like people throwing bowling balls into the water. Uh, it was like sharks crashing on bait. Like it, it was a whole other level of activity. And really I was like, wow, that's what I need to chase. That's what I need to target. Uh, I had heard of swim baits, but you know, this was kind of before the time that it was huge on social media. And, you know, there wasn't a lot out there on swim baits. I know that there was probably a few guys here doing it, but they were keeping quiet about it. Um, there was nobody that I knew really to go to or, or podcast to listen to or anything like that. So I thought, wow, if I figure this out, I have a market. And, you know, of course, in, in the United States, our biggest market for fishing is bass fishing. And in the biggest side of that or the biggest angle of that, Everybody wants to catch a 10 pound bass. You know, you all, everybody wants to build up to that place where you're finally targeting and successfully fishing for the giant bass. So that was, uh, that was what really got me into buckling down. And the next two months I spent every day just super excited and trying to figure out the technique, everything from how to cast them, how to fish them, how to swim, you know, swim them, how to set the hook, how to put them in the net. It's all very different and it uh, it's its own style so i've always loved a new challenge i always like new you know things that keep keep it fresh and and uh that was the key <laughs> you know I, I can really identify with that because uh if you've ever been on the ocean and seen 200 pound bluefin tuna uh, uh feeding on the surface or if you've seen uh you know big stripers or things like that there is nothing like seeing that side of mother nature at work yeah, it, I think uh, there's, if you have it in you, it's the eye of the tiger. You see that and you start, you get tunnel vision, and your hair stand up, you start sweating, like it's time to, it's go time. And that's what I love. So. <laughs> you know, Mother Nature is extremely violent. We don't see that all the time, but as you say, in those rare moments, there is something about that violence that is, I, I can't put my finger on it, but I know what it is. Primal. Yeah, yes. Definitely primal. Yes. And it exactly. takes us back. Good word, good word. Now, I, I, I've, I love your content on YouTube and on Instagram. Um, it's got, got an element of, it's got an element of humor, which is a lot of fun. But one of the things I key in on is, uh, is, is when you talk about big fish. Big fish are different than smaller fish. And I would just, I like to ask all of our guests, you know, their perspective on this, but but what do you think it is that gets a trophy fish to become a trophy size? Is it just lucky or is it smarter? How do, how do you uh, pinpoint the trophy fish? I'm not a biologist. So I know that, you know, that question probably entails a lot of genetics and 
you know, more factors than just, you know, does he act this way or do they act that way? Um, I, you know, I don't know about that. And then you also have to take into consideration the cycles of lakes and the cycles of, you know, seasons and nature and bait abundancy. So I, I don't know that side of it, but I can definitely touch on the fact that like it's it's a very different fish that you're targeting when you're chasing these trophy size bass compared to the targeting of the medium and the smaller numbers of fish that say you would go after in a tournament. And I think that for, you know, the, the big difference is that these, these larger, you know, trophy bass, they're more efficient and effective at feeding. And, and, you know, sometimes I hear, I, when I was growing up and I go to seminars, I would hear terms like big bass are lazy you know, these big trophy fish are lazy. They don't move much. Uh, I think that now that I've had, you know, eight years of guiding for them under my belt, I can tell you they're not lazy. They're efficient and they're effective. And they know better than to waste this much energy for this much return of food or possibly waste this much energy chasing something down unsuccessfully. It, you know, to me, the natural side of that is you're going to end up skinny and long. Right. And I, I think that these trophy bass, they want to carry a certain size on them for whatever reason, but they they are efficient. So that is the thing. And and for us is like how that translates into the fishing in my areas is that the difference between getting one of those big fish to commit and getting them to either not see him or to just get them to follow can be 12 inches on your cast. You know, because that fish knows it's not worth my time or my energy to chase this out of that zone that I'm used to seeing, as opposed to letting that thing come right and fall for my trap. Bass are an ambush predator, and it really took um, fishing swim baits to teach me that. Something that I can look back now and say, wow, for the last, my last lifetime, I was not fishing them as an ambush predator. I would go and, and set my boat 90 degrees of the shoreline. I would cast out and bring the bait out. And in my lakes, which are, you know, canyon reservoirs, that could equal casting into inches of water. And then within the first 20 feet, I can be in 20, 30, 40, 50 feet of water. So now I'm asking that ambush predator to leave its nature, you know, what nature has designed it to do, I'm telling him, hey, don't do that. Now come out here and act like a tuna or a wahoo and make, you know, endless circles and, you know, try to chase this bait down and overcome it with speed and, and you know, uh, uh, being able to last long at that speed with a sickle tail and a longer body. So really it teaches you to get in tune with this ambush predator and and figure out how to, you know, how to feed that fish and make it so that, your presentation becomes too hard to just let go by. You know, you know, you know speaking of feeding, um, where, where I live in Southern California, you know, the trout plants are very sporadic. They don't come very often. You're surprised when they show up. Yeah. And I'm not sure what it's like, you know, where you live there in Arizona, but um, they don't stock trout all the time. And when they do stock trout, they don't stock enough trout to feed every 10 pounder in the lake. So what do you see as secondary forage for these big fish? So what I I think what we've learned is uh, we have uh, bluegill, you know, the bluegill baits, and they do chase those at certain times of the year, which for me was always kind of a uh, spring, early summer. Um, there's small carp, uh, small common carp. There's small bass, and there's also uh, yellow bass in our, our lakes, which in Texas they also can call, I think, rockfish or something. So, but it's a smaller actual bass species, and uh, they, they definitely eat those a lot. I had always heard about that, too, because there's guys that like to target them, and there's always this you know, time of the year, which is usually the fall, where they'll be fighting those yellow bass, and all of a sudden a large bass will be – swarming the yellow bass that's on the end of their line and whether they connect and eat it or just swarming it you know lets you know oh there there's something else down there that's also swimming around with these yellow bass and eating them um and then you know bass i think i've learned they're very opportunistic 
So as the seasons go on, as there's more life around the water, being rodents, small birds, bats at night, you know, they're, they key in on all these little uh, forage options that come around to their world. So not, not anything in particular, but just the, everything that's around in that season. You know, it, it's interesting to hear you say that because my, my success with swim baits has come, have come primarily on bass pattern swim baits. And I, I was reminded again this weekend because I was out with at Fish Boy. We were, fi Seth Fish Boy, we were out fishing and uh, we were catching a bunch of small fish drop shotting, but we had at least three times big fish come up and try to eat the little bass that we were bringing to the bank, to the, to the boat. And it's just like, I think that a lot of people don't really understand how cannibalistic it is down there. Yeah, definitely. There's no, uh, there's no regard for cannibalism there. And uh, I think biologically they do fine eating each other. And the, you know, and you see it, I see it a lot too, uh, especially when those bass start to kind of grow like right now into that eight to 10 inch range. They're no longer like fingerlings, but they actually have become a little bit larger. Yeah. Uh, I think they key in on them at that time also. Yeah, they're good sources of protein. So mm -hmm. where do trophy size fish live? Uh, you know, that's a pretty, pretty open-ended question, but are they out on the points? Are they uh, up in the flats? Where are you looking for trophy fish when you're looking? What I've learned to do is to kind of break this all down as seasonal patterns. So there's by the seasons, which really are all in relation to where that timeline is along the spawn, right? In, in, uh, in Arizona, typically our bass would spawn in the spring in like March, that first full moon of March. It used to be like a huge wave would show up and all of a sudden they're spawning. Now with our latest weather patterns changing and, you know, other factors, it seems like that has gone out of whack and a lot, you know, now they sometimes spawn in July, but it, it really goes by, for me, it goes by seasonal patterns. If I was to just start, you know, like now in, in the fall, I kind of start prepping for my trips and I'm going to start looking for those, the seasonal patterns uh, in the fall makes it tough because they can be shallow or deep, but as it moves into winter, I can pretty much count on them going deeper than 20 feet. Uh, I've heard that that's because the water uh, temperatures don't change as much over there, depending on what's going on in our, you know, in our environment. Here in Arizona, we get, uh, you know, sometimes our summers can go on too long. Our winters, you know, are too short. Or they, you know, one day it can be really hot, one day really cold. So I, I've seen that our fish like stable temperatures. They dislike that that really big jumpy change in weather. So uh, seasonal patterns is I start from there and then as you get in tune, as you go out there, spend time on the water, you start kind of being able to pick up the nuances of daily changes or weekly changes and you start getting on you know, your pattern or your, your areas that you wanna fish and techniques. The new Frantic by Trophy Bass Baits is a three-piece segmented glide style swim bait. They call it that because, well, it's frantic. Check them out by going to at Swim Baits Plus. We're talking to Manny Chi. He is a professional swim bait guide located there in Arizona, the Phoenix, Arizona. Manny, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Uh, through Instagram or email. Um, everything's Manny Chi, M-A-N-N-Y-C-H-E-E. And uh, on, on that Instagram, you can uh, clip to the different links on my email, which is mannychi at gmail.com. You offer a professional swim bait guide service. Now, I've done some guiding years ago. If I had to rely on catching trophy fish for my clients, I would have never been able to do it. What, what's the secret? How, how do you, I mean, do you offer guarantees? What, what is, how do you do that? Uh, I would say I definitely don't offer guarantees. <laughs> the, only, the only guarantee you would get is that you're going to get a day on the water where we're going to go over various techniques that whether they worked here that day or not, they're definitely techniques that you can take back home to whether it's your home in Spain, your home in Southern California, your home on the East Coast, your home in Texas. You can take those techniques back and put time on your water 
and you will catch bigger fish. It has happened time and time again. You know, we can go through the Instagram feed and I can show you this guy came out, it got the tune up and came, went back and now he's popping, you know, eight, you know, eights, nines, tens, twelves. Um, so that was the only guarantee I had. But that being said, uh, our bite got much harder about two years ago when we had a golden algae kill. So that destroyed our fish, our fisheries. And it's going to take time to repair. And they'll come back eventually. But before that, for a good five years, um, I could really, I could count on one hand the amount of trips in a, on a full schedule for a season that like would not get a chance at all. Wow. Other than that, we were doing techniques. We were fishing the baits in, in ways that I found if we go out there and we put in a hard grind, uh, you know, a full day hard grind, we will at least get a chance at a fish that's somewhere in that five, eight, you know, to 10 pound range. And it was almost a guarantee that we would at least get a chance. I could guarantee that before. Yeah. Uh, nowadays it's, it's much tougher. That's more like a needle in a haystack. But again, just the way our lakes, uh, the features that they have, I can take you to a lake and show you how to fish ledges, how to work the electronics, how to uh, use mapping to your advantage to place those casts in the right spots how to read the water, and more importantly, or you know, equally importantly, how to fish the baits, how to grab a glide bait, any glide bait, and say, okay, this is the react, you know, this is the, the swim that I need to give it for it to do the proper swim, or you know, how to swim a soft bait. So it, it was, uh, like I said, it was definitely like, it, there's, it's a learning lesson. We don't just go to to one spot on the lake and no, oh, this is my little secret spot and I just sit here and cast and cast all day long. No, like I, my trips are were always more instructional and I tried to, sure, take advantage of bite windows if we had them, you know, out here a lot, one thing that happens a lot is early morning, like right in that time before the sun really peaks, that's like our big chance to catch some of these fish. So we would, you know, try to really focus on catching the fish then and then, you know, hey, it's calmed down. The day has progressed. Now let's go and teach you how to fish a ledge. Let's go work these baits in the toolies. Let's go, you know, throw along the docks. So there, there was a good amount of, uh, you know, points, shoreline, different features that we, can, that we can go over and, you know, lessons that you can take home and build upon. Now, now I, I'm a conventional fisherman. I grew up fishing conventionally, you know, the small worms and all that kind of stuff. My son, Seth, got me, got me into swim bait fishing. So about, for about two years now, I've, I've thrown a lot of swim baits. And I don't claim to have any really expertise other than I can tell you that I do know that every type of bait has a different personality, whether it's a swimmer, whether it's a glide. And you need to spend a lot of time learning how these things work because it's not just like a drop shot where you drop it down and jiggle it and they bite. These baits, you got to learn how to use them, right? Yeah, and it's it really makes the difference between getting a follower, right. getting no followers, getting fish to commit, getting fish to eat it right, to eat it well, or to just kind of nip curiously at your bait. All of that has to do with the swim and, you know, also the angle and, and how you presented the bait, reading the water. But it's a, a huge amount of it is the actual – learning how to fish the baits and there's a big difference even in baits of the same brand of a you know a bait drop that happened six months ago and one that you bought recently uh, I'm not a bait maker I don't know a lot about that stuff but I do know that even the ambient temperature the uh, the humidity level all of that affects the resin curing and the, the pouring of the rubber you know, that all has effect on that. So even baits that are the same brand and the same model might require a different speed, a different cadence. Uh, you know, it, everything has its, its little nuances. And I find it important to teach people how to understand the basics of what like a glide bait needs to swim like, what a rat should be doing, you know, a rat weight bait, uh, what a soft bait you know, you've seen how touchy even a soft bait can be. If you go too fast, it'll roll on its side. If you go too slow, the tail doesn't quite kick, the head doesn't quite wobble. So yeah, they all have their nuances and uh, it's really important to 
spend the time on the water and watch your bait and and see how you need to respond to what the bait is doing hey in one of your videos you talked about something that i thought was just spectacular when you talked about the body language of a fish we've all had that frustration of that fish coming up right underneath your bait and then he just kind of swims off and you talk about the body language and how you learn to work with that i would love to have you talk about that for a couple of minutes here yeah, in those uh, in those early like first four or five years, we used to get a lot of uh, a lot of fish that would follow, and obviously you need to have some water clarity to be able to see your bait and to be able to see the fish, and uh, you know I could I could pretty quickly tell just from how that fish was behaving in relation to the bait, if you know do we have a chance at getting bit here by this fish, do we not have a chance and just take it as like research, you know, and, and know that, oh, a fish is using this spot, but right now it's not going to happen. Maybe we come back later with another presentation, another bait, another speed, whatever it is. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was definitely like, you know, if I had a fish that was coming after, you know, the glide baits are the ones that they would follow a lot. And if I had a fish where the, the glide bait is doing its action and that fish was just hanging out in its, uh, in its blind zone, which is right behind and underneath a bait, then I knew, and if it was just cruising straight, I knew like, mm, there's not much chance of this turning into anything. It's just a little show of a fish. Now, the opposite of that would be that glide bait is doing its glides and all of a sudden we see a fish that is dipping and diving yeah. with the bait. It's almost like it's tracking its cadence and figuring out how to zero in. You know, that one, it was like, get ready, get ready. You know, it's coming, it's, it's gonna happen. Like that one, we could just tell. Sometimes also you would see a fish and you would see this uh, gills starting to like breathe heavy, kind of like, you know, think of like a free diver about to go down, like, you know, it would like start popping its gills. They would start getting like excited and you would see their fins start to quiver. Um, sometimes you would even see a color change in the fish. You would see them light up. Whereas some of those other ones would stay dull and just kind of slowly follow. So yeah, I, those, the glide baits really started, uh, you know, having this whole awesome aspect where it's like, man, I'm really learning a lot about this predator, how it behaves how it tracks down its prey and like i said even just by seeing it from far away like what the, knowing that thing's gonna eat if i do the right things or not and then the other side of that was also how to tease these fish uh just like playing with a cat you can you can tease it into committing you know and you can take a fish that was maybe in a medium kind of activity level as far as the dipping side to side and displays to full on committing by how you played that bait. And a lot of that was kind of, uh, as I've seen a lot of predators where it's, they want to get close and then the bait kind of pushes away and they want to close that gap a little, but the bait doesn't let them. And you know, when to let them come closer, when to pull away to make them chase more. That was all part of that, that teasing and that, uh, that body language and really getting them to, again, make full committals where they're, they're biting the bait and they're already going down into the water column with that bait. So it's not a big deal about setting the hook and you know it's different from the not doing enough movement and getting them to just come up and inquisitively nip, nip at the bait and let go, kind of bite and let go, bite and let go. To me, that was like, hey, you're not doing enough to tease him, to make him think, hey, I got to commit here or I'm going to lose my chance. Uh, that was kind of a lot of what I've learned. That, that's, that is phenomenal stuff right there. I mean, uh, this is, this is uh, the kind of thing that somebody watching this can really glom onto because it, it is so close. We've, we've seen those followers and it's so frustrating, but you, you can engage them. It's almost like, especially with a glide bait, making the bait move without moving it. Moving it too yeah, far away from uh, my theory to to like working a glide bait is uh, you know if you just pull them out the box and you go cast them and you just do a steady retrieve you're gonna get like this big nice S right and you see it if you're seeing it for the first time you're like oh my god I've never seen a bait act like this 
this is so awesome. It's so natural. You know, a fish is going to definitely cover this. And what's happened is that, like, I've come to learn that the action of the glide is when it changes direction. That's when it, the colors change. It flashes. It, the direction changes in the head. Like, that is kind of, that is the action when that, that switch happens. So when I first went out and started doing just a slow, mellow, S-wavy kind of turn, that's when I would get a lot of those inquisitive follows. They knew they had time. They liked the bait. Maybe it's in the right zone, but there's not really, like, why is this bait not trying to get away from me? You know, I'm the, I think the bass is more, any predator is more used to coming up on its prey and having to, you know, having to do things to adjust to the prey's behavior. And so I, I remember people talking about like topwaters, right? And how like trying to get the most action out of that bait without getting out of the strike zone. And then again, back to like how my legs set up moving out of that strike zone meant that the longer that it followed, the more that fish is moving into deep open water coming out of its behavior, out of its natural way of ambush. So what I want to do is instead work that bait more like a Z. So instead of a big S, make that thing cut like a Z. And that doesn't mean that I'm working it fast. It just means that like I'm getting more of those turns per foot, you know, of, of strike zone than I was with the S. And when I started doing that and really kind of, oh, realizing that, hey, this glide bait is more like a reaction bait than it is like a soft bait where I want them to, you know, a soft bait, sure, go ahead, look at it. It looks real. It's, you know, it's doing a very mellow kind of swim. No, the glide bait was, you know, you got to think of it more like a jerk bait. You know, you don't, Usually, again, you know, it's fishing, so everything goes, right? There's always going to be, there's always going to be a, a rule breaker. There's always going to be a time when they were doing the opposite. But for the most part, you don't want like a bass to sit there and look at your jerk bait too long. You want to kind of keep it alive, like it's a struggling minnow. Same thing with the glide bait. I don't want them to check that bait out too much. They'll start realizing like something's up here. That thing's not a real fish. So I want those action flashes color changes uh head turns i want more of those and using you know getting more of that action per square foot so that i'm not losing uh losing action so so maybe uh, maybe a retrieve a slow retrieve until you eyeball one till you see one and then more rod tip snaps that kind of a thing yeah that was definitely something that uh, i like telling my clients is to be dynamic with your whole presentation from start to finish. Uh, in, in swim baits, we want to usually cast from deep to shallow, sorry, deep to shallow or work the bait from outside of the strike zone into its strike zone, into that ambush point. So yeah, for me, I tell people like, hey, you know, maybe at first when it's out there, you, you go a little like slower, you're still doing that cut so that you're not getting the big wavy turn but maybe you're letting it go all the way to the end of its glide and then hand, you know, cutting it back all the way to its glide, cutting it back. And then as you're getting closer to that zone, think of what the, you know, think of what's going on in the bait fishes world too. They're coming out from the deeper water. They want refuge in this, uh, you know, in this spot that for the bass is an ambush point for them, it's possible cover, right? It might be a little rock, you know, a rock ledge or a tree or a bush or a buoy something where there's cover where they can find a little bit of protection you know where i'm working into that but at the same time as a bait fish i'm a little bit nervous and i'm kind of like i want to hang out here but i know that this is where this predator hangs out so that's where i start you know getting nervous getting nervous getting more cuts and i've seen you know many times where well actually as it's coming to that strike zone that fish like leaves its strike leaves that ambush spot and is like already coming to chase it Almost like, I don't want someone else to eat it. This thing's already coming into my game. Boom! And they come up and hammer it. And that's when you get those positive eats, big, hard, you know, easy hook sets. So that, that's something that, you know, yeah, be dynamic with it. And then, you know, if it doesn't eat it, again, now we're even more dynamic with the teasing of that fish. So, yeah, never, uh, you know, never just kind of mindlessly 
swimming the bay, actually be dynamic with the whole thing. It's a whole presentation. And that presentation has to be taken into account as a whole. Yeah, that, 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 is, that is so, so perfect. Uh, such a great description of that. How about scents? You believe in scents on swim baits? You believe like um, in a scent trail? Or? Yeah, I use them on the soft baits, but I don't think that there's an any olfactory kind of, you know, side to it in the bass. I don't think they smell in the water. Uh, I know they have a lateral line. I know they have a very sophisticated system of uh, resonate, like a resonating chamber with the swim bladder. Uh, there's a whole set of, of bones that talk to the brain that let them know what, you know, when something makes a splash in the water, they can instantly know what size that is, what profile that has. So I don't think that it's like a tracking down and helping to get bit. I think for, I think that it's a lubricant. You know, the bass has these teeth that are like a, like sandpaper. And when we're using these soft baits, if they, you know, you can imagine if they bite, when they bite that, you now, you know, you need to get them to, to eat it, but then you need to bust open the mouth and be able to slide that bait out to impale the hook. So if you don't have lubricant on it, it's not like a, it doesn't mess it up completely, but it's just any advantage helps, especially when you're, you know, you could possibly be with the biggest fish in your life or the biggest fish in the lake is on the end of your line. So you want every advantage. And it was always just more like a lubricant to help with the hook sets. Now, I also, you know, does it also maybe help in that when they bite that, they get the feeling that, oh, you know, the fish I eat have a slime coat on them, right? All fish have slime coat, protective slime coat over them. So maybe that helps them to say like, oh yeah, that feels like what I really eat. So they start, you know, positioning in their mouth and, you know, start to eat it well, which is when you get the bass to have it choked as opposed to just bit on the outside. But that's my, my thing with scents. And, um, I, you know, as far as like scent brands or smells, I would just say that I, I started out with a certain brand that was a very offensive smell. It stained, you know, if you got it on you, it would stain your clothing. It smelled horrible. You're, if you were smothering on with your fingers, we had to you know, use the tail to touch it. And, oh, no, I got it on me. And then there's other stuff that like, oh, that doesn't matter. It, it's, you know, it's not an offensive smell. It even smells like pizza or it smells like coffee or, you know, it smells like a crab or kind of seafood kind of smell, you know? So uh, I don't think that the scent, what, what kind of flavor matters as much, just that it has that lubricant on it and then just go with one that you, you like using, you know, like I said, this, that doesn't stain your clothes. It doesn't smell horrible. That doesn't end up all over your boat. <laughs> that was my take on scents. I smell a rat. Do you want to get in on the rat swim bait craze? Check out You Dirty Rat by Trophy Bass Baits, available at Swim Baits Plus. Visit their Instagram account, at Swim Baits Plus, and find out what the noise is all about. We're talking to Manny Chi. He is a trophy hunter. As you can see behind him, he, he hunts trophies of all kind. He's also a professional swim bait guide. And Manny, I, I, I want to talk to you now about the flutter spoon craze. Now, it may not be new to you, but it's something that is that I feel like I'm hearing about all over the place. I'm seeing guys in Bassmaster, Bassmaster tournaments using these big flutter spoons. And uh, I also caught uh, uh, one of your videos. You talked all about it, and uh, I, I'm hooked. Is it work well on largemouth, or is it just a striper presentation? What, how does it all work? So for me, it's kind of the same as you. Like I is one of those things that I had heard about them when they came out, like the giant flutter spoons, right? I'd always, yes, spoon fishing in itself has always been, a, you know, ageless technique. But when uh, it really caught my eye when they started putting out these big spoons, and uh, it kind of came at the time that was like the end of our big fish cycle out here. But I had a friend who I was talking to a lot that while we were out there fishing the big swim baits, he was putting in the time and the work with the big flutter spoons and same kind of thing where he started out catching the fours and fives and the eights, and then finally caught his DDs on them. And, uh, so they definitely work. Uh, but I unfortunately did not get much time to really show them to those big bass as much as I would have liked. Uh, so for me, the, you know, I've, 
kind of been throwing them for maybe a year and a half, two years maybe. And I, I, they came to me when I was already fishing a lake that has stripers. Not all of our lakes have the striped bass. So I had to leave those lakes and move to another lake. And uh, that was one that had stripers. And that's where I started really um, targeting them with those spoons, learning a lot about, you know, the movement of them, how they work, what kind of fish I target with them. And also, which was something new for me, was using the electronics in a vertical presentation. You know, before the the graphs were, you know, with the swim baits, it was always, I, I wasn't trying to catch a fish right under my boat on a swim bait, right? A swim bait, I was more, and you know, it's being a glide bait, a soft bait, a wake bait. Those, I was casting it out to a spot, working it back to the boat. So it, it didn't really matter to me what was going on right underneath. Uh, and in these spoon techniques, you can cast them out, work them back, but I also love fishing and catching those fish that are right under the under the boat. And what I was looking for with those is when I'm really seeing a school of them, which on the graph, on the screen, it looks like these long lines that are coming through and they're almost like going up and down. So you can imagine underwater, it's like they're working in unison, they're working as a team in a school. And I think that some you know, fish come down and boom, make bait fish come up. And then the ones on the top get to eat them. So it's almost, they look on the graph. It looks like they're doing this like horse running kind of behavior. And that's the stuff that I'm looking for, which I've called like, you know, mom spaghetti. Like it looks like spaghetti lines going up and down. And then you can tell the different, I've even learned to, to um, distinguish the size of those fish on the graph by seeing actually okay that's what oh there it is i caught it you can see them on the grid you'll see your bait on the graph and you see them come up and start fighting it and this is just all with the, the regular standard sonar um but it it really made it a, a lot of fun and a whole new kind of aspect of fishing and and a whole different technique for me you talk a lot about correct depth when you're tr when, you, when you're targeting trophy fish establish that correct depth and stay in that correct depth when you're fishing. And I would think that these flutter spoons are kind of in that thing. So it, let's say we're going out tomorrow, and we're going to one of these days, Manny. I am going to come out and fish with you one of these days. I promise that. But let's say we're, 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 we're in the marina. We're moving out past the five-mile-an-hour zone. How do you establish the correct depth? Is that something that happens in the marina or when you get out in the lake or what? Uh, that's one of those things that are what I've seen as a seasonal, like a seasonal position. So as those seasons go, you know, in the winter, it kind of seems to be more like 20 feet and deeper um, as it, and, and so I set my hummingbird, the graph, I have a, gra a highlight, a depth highlight, so I can highlight those 10, 20 feet of depth, and I can now see very clearly on the graph, like where those spots are that look really good, that have the features I'm looking for, and I can hit those areas, target just those areas instead of kind of just blindly fishing a cove or, you know, or just casting and fan casting every single spot on a point. I can now target exactly where my boat needs to be, where my cast needs to be so that I'm, you know, using that time on the water for the best. So it, it happens by uh, seasonal patterns and then kind of figuring out those nuances. Again, it, they seem to uh, feed in cycles, right? A lot of it for me seems to be like around moon cycles. So they kind of use that moon the same way that we use uh, the, the circadian rhythms of the sun, where when that sun is in the middle, we all kind of get this lunchtime hunger. As it goes down and becomes evening, we all kind of get this hunger that's our body telling us we need to eat before we hunker down to go to sleep. I think that the same thing happens in a bass's world, but it goes through the whole cycle of the moon. So you have these multiple days of hard feeding, and then you have these multiple tapers off of that feed time. And, and I, all of that take, ha, comes into account to where, you know, what that depth is. But a good start is just a seasonal pattern of it. In the spring, once those fish are in, you know, in the spawn or just out of you know, the spawn, the post-spawn, it seems to be like, for me, it's like 10 to 15 feet, teen feet, 13 to 19 feet. I set my graph to that. And if there's not something visibly that we're casting to on the shoreline, 
then we're casting to that zone because that's something that it's underwater and the fish are hanging out there. You know, in that time, what I see is like those big females, they hunker down right in that zone, 13 to, you know, not 13 to 15, 17 feet. And it's like they're hunkered down there and they're just watching those beds with the smaller males that they have up shallower and they're hunkered down. And what I've seen is like when something, when something small comes to mess with the bed, the male has to take care of that. But when it's something bigger, like your swim bait, that they cannot, you know, the smaller male doesn't have a good chance of fighting off, that's when the female zooms up and, like, takes care of the situation. Or also just it seems like that whole zone, that whole 15, you know, 15-ish zone, they want to control, like, the, the, the vibration and the energy levels that are going on there. So that's a time when we would take some of those multi-piece baits, like the like the bollum, and something that's louder and making a lot of you know a lot of action, and it's really it's just like causing more commotion than that female is comfortable with, and she'll come up and hit that. So that that's kind of how I use that depth zone. So okay, so again, with that correct zone, correct depth zone, I just think that's really really important for anglers to understand that. You, may, you also made a comment in, in the video that I was watching that you said largies tend to micromanage that depth zone, stripers tend to macromanage that. I, I was fascinated by that. Tell me what you mean by that. Um, what I found by that was, uh, again, kind of how a, a largemouth will take, let's say if we're talking about like a little rock point, the largemouth will get up in that and really, it, you know, since they are the ambush predator, they're going to really figure out how the bait uses that. And in the micromanaging, I feel like the largemouths really learn to understand how the bait fish relates to this certain spot, right? Which might be a rock rubble in, in 15 feet of water. The largemouth will really learn like what, how that bait comes into it, and he'll micromanage that spot. He won't go too far uh, shallow, won't go too far deep, won't really spread out far from that. It'll it'll really learn how it uses it. And when it comes to that, I almost think you know that there was the the researcher Temple Graydon, Temple Graydon, Graydon. I forgot her last name, but she was a like a behavioral scientist for cattle. She's the one that invented a lot of like the modern, uh, the modern way that we move cattle in and out of, of grazing areas to loading up in the truck or whatever. Because she was autistic, she was able to understand that, wait a minute, we're having all these troubles at this turn right here because cattle don't like a sharp turn. Cattle don't like a you know, seeing the shiny objects, your trucks are parked behind there. You got to move them and it'll help the flow of that cattle go in and out. I think the same things go on with the bait fish. You know, we don't have any biologists that really can understand the bait fish like that, but I think the bait fish also have their key things that will stop them, that will keep them going, you know, left, that'll make them funnel. A lot of the times they're like funnels and you can see them on those depths and you tell like, oh, it really funnels right there. So that largemouth will be at the bottom of the funnel and knows that that bait fish will come out here and then they don't like that tree, but they like this rock. They come over here for cover and that's where I snatch them. So that's kind of like my way of thinking of how a bass, a, a largemouth micromanages an area. He really keys in and really wants to not spend that big, huge energy chasing them around. He wants to wait at the bottom of that funnel where he knows like, yeah, one or two of them might make their way over here and that's okay because I know three, four or five of them will come right at that funnel. On the opposite of that is the striped bass, which for us, these striped bass are a landlocked saltwater fish. So those striped bass have a different, uh, different striation of the muscle. They're able to keep swimming. They're, they just swim, 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 swim. So they're able to look at a whole cove and say, okay, where's that 32 to 35 feet? And we're just gonna chase that around and we're gonna corral. They're more like, they more like they work in sync, they work together in schools 
and they're happy corralling and running those bait balls and bait fish down, boom, 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 until they come, you know, whether it's up to the surface or up against the ledge, they're, they're fine. Their metabolism is okay with chasing those things down and wasting a bunch of energy to then eat a lot of them. And that's, you know, that's what I think is the big difference between the two is that, again, the bass is an ambush predator, efficient and effective. The striped bass is, has those different muscles, the different tail styles where they can just keep going and eventually they'll either tire out the bait or push them into a certain zone where they just cream them after that. That's, that is, that's, that's absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, you. Where, where do you see swim baits going? I keep hearing from everybody that, uh, oh, the fish are getting conditioned to these baits. And, you know, where do you see the, the, the future of swim baits? Maybe colors, maybe shapes, maybe styles. I see a lot of three-segmented bla- three, uh, segmented body swim baits and swim baits now and, uh-huh. and uh, you know, eight, nine segments. What, what do you see? What's going to happen? What should well, happen? <laughs> I, you know, uh, unfortunately, it's hard for me to say that because – Again, our fish experienced a huge fish kill, and there was an actual poison in the water that kept them from wanting to be shallow at all. So a lot of our fish moved out, really, the ones that were going to survive were the ones that moved deep. And it's almost like you now, all of your subsurface and surface baits, they weren't really getting the attention or the bites or even seeing fish with them. So we had to move into deeper baits. And then it also seemed like uh, it also seemed like the size had to change. Before it used to be the bigger the better. If you gave me a 13-inch bait, I can tell you we're gonna see even bigger fish follow this one. And then now, you know, the trend that I've seen is that we have to downsize everything. Uh, you know, now it's it's much. You know, it, it could be more effective to use those smaller, a little bit smaller size, the eight-inch range. Um, you know, it's hard to tell, but even just from like watching Instagram, you can see how different parts of the nation are experiencing different cycles of this swim bait bite, you know, right. There was a time maybe two, three years ago when it was like the East coast was on that, you know, the Massachusetts guys were the ones that were able to use those huge soft baits, huge glide baits. And you know, get get bid and catch these great fish for their for their places. And then it like turned into the south. And then you know, it it went for where us in the west were struggling more on that, and we had to downsize. So again, I think it has to do with these cycles, this you know, ever changing environment that we live in. Um, you know, the, the world has been changing its cycles for the last 13,000 years. Ever since the end of the last ice age, it's been progressively warming. And in that we have those El Nino seasons where when I look back at some of my early videos, I can go through and I can tell like it, it was wet. It was more wet, right? It was raining more. There were more days that were overcast with lower, um, you know, lower pressure days. There was more days with wind. There was more like things that helped these bass target their bait and help them, you know, throw off the bait a little more to give them an advantage in the water. Because what I see is like the worst thing for a largemouth is a no, you know, a, a super sunny day, high, you know, high pressure day, no wind, dead water. That's when, you know, if you think that's when a largemouth that's trying to hide from his bait, from his uh, prey that's when it's going to be hardest for him because there's no advantage for him. It's going to be easier when the bait is a little bit getting thrown off by wind and having to struggle to stay, you know, stay straight and stay in its swim. That's, you know, all those things give them an advantage, low light, wind. So when I look back at those times, I saw a lot more of those days in the early days for us. And now it's been a lot more of just those bright, sunny, hot summers that go on too long you know uh, for us the big killer is when like this time of the year when it doesn't snap we don't really have four seasons over here in the phoenix area we have like two it's a tremendous summer and then all of a sudden it's winter and when those don't quite snap and it stays hot for too long that's when our bites get tough so I, that's what i see coming up Manny, this has been an absolutely amazing segment, and I, I appreciate you taking your time to be with us today. Um, 
Say that Instagram account again, and so we'll get that up on the screen for you. It's Manny Chi, M-A-N-N-Y-C-H-E-E, and uh, Manny Chi at gmail.com. And then also the website right now is down. I, I was lucky enough to pay for another year, and then they said, oh, yeah, something happened. Sorry, you got to redo your website. So I'm in the process of getting that back up, but when that's up and running, it's also just mannychi.com, M-A-N-N-Y. C-H-E-E. Thank you so much for being with us. This is, this is a wealth of information. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you for having me.